Hey guys, King Gath here, and in this guide, we're going to go over the virtual resource system. As always, when I start these guide videos, I want to preface with two things and say, one, if you prefer this information in text form, it is available on our website at wiki.simsettlements2.com. And the second is that if you find any of the options I'm showing you overwhelming or not fun, you can most likely disable or change it in our settings. We have a deep hollow tape with lots of gameplay options, as well as an MCM config menu. So virtual resources are a system of resources where the settlers store things outside of the player's ability to access them. So they will collect their own junk, their own caps, and their own items they use for the various activities in Sims Elements 2. Now the reason we did this is to prevent you from breaking the base game economy. One of the problems we had in Sims Elements 1 is that since we gave the player access to large quantities of junk from the industrial plots, it quickly got to a point where the rest of the game's loot was completely unimportant. So in this case, we wanted to be able to go to much higher numbers than would be sustainable by the player's inventory alone. We wanted to get into thousands of resources and the costs because very quickly when you build build up a handful of settlements, you can get very, very rich. So with SS2, we went to the virtual resource system so that we could get to these high numbers without completely invalidating the rest of the game's economy and making it so that you are still incentivized to play the rest of the game the way it was meant to be played. So all resources generated by SS2 are kept aside away from the player. There are a couple of exceptions and ways to gain personal benefits for your character, which we'll discuss across the rest of this guide series, but know for starters that the general purpose of the virtual resources is to prevent from breaking the base game economy and that's why you don't have access to those resources now one of the most important elements of this in order to engage with the system is you need to know how many resources the settlers have now you can play without knowing that information if you just let everything happen automatically but you will find it much easier to deal with if you have the panel on the right side of my screen we call that the resource panel and you will get that if you install the mod hud framework that mod is available on xbox and pc it's very very small and it enables all of our HUD elements that we have available for SS2, with the exception of the floating icons. Those are provided directly by SS2. Now, the one place you cannot get this HUD is in VR. Unfortunately, we do not have a framework from the community yet for creating HUD elements in VR, but a mod author out there did create a way to see your virtual resources in VR. I will have a link in the description to that mod below if you are playing in VR. If you are watching at this time and play in VR and you know that a new HUD framework has come out for it and uh, we are not tapped into it yet, definitely leave a comment below and maybe I just didn't know about it yet and I will get that updated. All right, let's dive a little deeper into that HUD because some of you are probably seeing something slightly different than what I have on the right side of my screen currently. So the resources in Sim Settlements 2 have a difficulty setting called resource complexity. And this is designed to let the player decide how involved they want to get with the actual production and collection of resources for their settlers. So this is by default tied to your gameplay difficulty, and it also gets changed if you choose an options profile in the holotape when you first launch it in SS2. So right now what I have on my screen is what we call simple complexity. This is where you have to track a very minimal number of resources, just caps and scrap. So just any generic scrap will work for all construction and all various costs throughout SS2, other than supply costs, which we'll talk about later. That has to do with new mechanics that were introduced during the launch of chapter three. So for the most part, if you're in the early game, you're gonna be focused on scrap and then later caps. In fact, if you aren't using some of our more difficult options, you may never need caps in most of SS2's gameplay mechanics. And so you'll be focused almost entirely on one resource, which is scrap. Now, if you're playing on a little bit higher difficulty, so if you're playing on a anything less than survival, but higher than easy, you will default to what we call category complexity. And that's where the resources are broken down into a series of categories, which are building materials, organic materials, machine parts, and rare materials. And those are going in order from top to bottom there. Speaking of all of these different icons, there are quite a lot of icons throughout SS2, especially when we get to the next difficulty, which is component complexity, where you're using the full breakdown of scrap that's in the base game of Fallout 4, which would include things like aluminum, steel, asbestos, antiseptic, etc. When you want to figure out what those icons are, you might need a legend. We have that available on our wiki. I've got that linked below so you can see what all these different icons represent, though you'll find that you quickly learn them, especially when you realize they're all tied to base game scrap items. But we do have quite a few icons throughout the mod, so it can be useful to look at that legend periodically. 
So this last resource difficulty of component complexity is designed for hardcore players, and that is why it is chosen for survival players or those who choose hardcore if they get the options wizard in the hollow tape. And this will require you to maintain a large amount of resources across the board in a lot of different categories and component levels. So this can be very, very difficult for new players, and that is why for the most part, most of you will find yourselves defaulting to this setting. So once you have your complexity figured out, you know where you're at, you should be able to follow along. Now, if you do have an additional set of resources below what you're seeing on my screen, that will happen once you start establishing outposts, which is something that happens during the chapter three story. And uh, we'll discuss that in another video. So for now, we're gonna focus on the scrap aspect, but don't worry if you do see additional items beyond this, even in category complexity, that is for another system. The next thing worth discussing in resources is resource storage. So you'll notice that on my screen there, I have the little scrap icon, which is the hammer and wrench cross. And this is zero out of 600. And that means I have zero scrap out of a possible 600 stored. So all of the different categories, or if I was playing in component complexity, all the different components share one storage. So scrap is stored regardless of the type. You don't have to maintain a bunch of different storage types. Now, by default, you gain access to scrap storage by building most industrial plots. You'll see that uh, they include some amount of scrap. So this basic junk gathering plot we have here provides 600 capacity to our storage. As it levels up, it will increase that amount. Now, if you find that you don't have enough storage still and you don't have any more settlers to build industrial plots with, you have another option for increasing your max storage, and that is the resource storage category of the SS2 build menu. You can build things like the shipping containers, and there are a variety of sizes available that increase the storage by a variety of amounts. They also will increase the defense requirements for your settlements. So if you build a lot of these, you will find that you are more likely to be attacked and that your settlers uh, will require more defense before they will upgrade. So there is a limit to how much you can do this safely before you will kind of soft lock yourself out of any upgrades. So I would not recommend just spamming these, but like I said at the beginning of the video, you can disable that setting if you just want to be able to build unlimited scrap storage. The idea behind the defense requirements is that you're making yourself a target, you're showing raiders that you have a lot of supplies available. So you can go ahead and build more of these to increase your storage, but it will increase your defense needs. Note that with the defense system in the base game, the HUD at the top of your screen is tied to the vanilla mechanics, which are that defense just needs to match your uh, your food and water output, but in SS2 we have our own meters on the left there which show the actual needs required for, for SS2's requirements, which are things like your plot upgrades are going to look for those numbers as opposed to the numbers at the top. So just because your numbers are green at the top of the screen does not mean your needs are satisfied. You should look at the meters on the left, which is another reason you should grab HUD framework because without it you're not going to see that information on the left side of your screen there. All right, the next thing to talk about is where you actually get those virtual resources. So there are several different ways you can get them, but we're going to focus on the easiest two. So the first one is to just donate items yourself. So if you build a city planner's desk, which you can find under the Sim Settlements furniture menu, this has on it a little safe that is labeled city resources. So if we click manage here and hit donate items, we will be brought up and we can actually just drop in junk right from our inventory. So if we go to our junk tab and just drop a handful of things in, I will warn you if you are on a lower end system, if you are playing with a gigantic load order, if you're on Xbox, I would limit yourself to maybe 10 different items at a time. If you go too many, uh, the game scripting engine can get overwhelmed and some players find that it crashes the game. So I would just do a handful at a time and then just simply exit the container and a few moments later you'll get a notice telling you that the settlers are either using the scrap or if they ran out of space you'll get it put right back in your inventory and so now if we were to go back into workshop mode and see the resource panel you can see we now have 30 scrap available scattered across a variety of categories so that is one way there is a second way you can donate which is tied nicely to the other way to get resources. So we'll talk about them in tandem. So the next way to get resources besides donating them yourself, and donating them yourself is a great way early game, but you'll quickly find that the costs needed by your settlers far exceeds what you could possibly do manually by grabbing junk around the game world. And so that is where industrial plots come in. So the very first industrial class that you have access to is the junk gathering plot. And this is one of the few plots that actually creates a benefit for you, the player. 
every day this will drop a variety of junk items inside of your workbench. So if we head on over here and we go to transfer, you can see there is a fair amount of junk here. So this is one of the ways you can actually gain a personal advantage because if you wanted, you could take that stuff out, you could sell it, you can use it for building in workshop mode. Though there is a cap on the amount of items that will be placed in there. This is a base game mechanic. It has nothing to do with SS2, but it will cap how much stuff. There are mods that change that, but by default, the game does cap how much stuff will be produced in the workshop and we leave that limit in place because we don't want to break the base game economy. So these junk gathering will create that. So to get that into virtual resources so that your settlers are allowed to spend it on their own without you interfering, you can do a couple of things. One, you can obviously grab those items out of the, the inventory there and go manually donate them. Or you can come here and hit donate workbench contents. Now I mentioned before that for some players, donating too many items can cause a game crash. So I would save before you do this in case that that is the case for you, because this is effectively the same thing as you walking over to the workbench, grabbing all the items and dropping them in. This just does it one step for you. Uh, my computer should be fine. So we're going to go ahead and hit donate all. And then effectively it goes through the same thing. It's going to check that you have enough space. It's going to distribute them across the components or categories depending on what complexity you're playing in and put them into the storage for you so in just a moment we should get here so the settlers are planning on how best to use your scrap donation and in this case they're planning on how best to use our equipment supply donation because we donated some supplies as well so this is a good chance to uh, show you guys the HUD there. You can see that we now have the supply section. There'll be a dedicated video talking about supply resources, but uh, know that that's things that are not scrap. So that's going to be obviously probably from those icons, you can tell it's things like ammo, armor, chems, and weapons. Uh, and uh, again, there'll be another video for that. But when we donate it all, it did donate some of that stuff as well. So now you have our storage is full. You see it's uh, 600 out of 600 and the scrap. And the so some of the scrap likely went back to the workbench there because we donated the workbench content. So if we were to come back in here, we'll see that there still is uh, a small amount of things in here with 275 wood remaining. And so if we wanted to donate all of that, we would need to increase our scrap storage. Now, if you want things to be produced directly into virtual storage, you'll need to use some of the other industrial building classes. So one of the first ones you will unlock is called building materials gathering. So if we go over here to our racing sensor, we should have access to it already. If we choose building plan or we could build a new industrial plot. And that is one of the first ones. Now, I already I've cheated for the sake of uh, this tutorial video. I've got everything unlocked, but you should get building materials gathering unlocked very, very early. In fact, I think this is the very first building plan that uh, the stranger builds if you are playing through the story. So building materials, you'll get access to almost immediately. And then over time, you'll unlock the higher classes. So eventually you'll unlock organic machine parts, rare materials, and then we've got conversion and production, which are a little bit more advanced. And we'll talk about individual classes in a future video. So if you're looking for resources to go direct to virtual resources, early game, you're gonna wanna build lots of building material gathering. And then if you're looking for stuff that you can build in workshop mode, you're gonna wanna go for junk gathering. All right, guys, the last thing we're gonna cover in virtual resource basics is sharing your resources. So after you've got your first settlement established with a good amount of production, you've got a lot of surplus resources, you're likely gonna to wanna to share those with your other settlements to get them building up faster. And you do this through a special building class called Caravan Services. This is available on the municipal plot type, which you unlock during our story. Caravan Services itself unlocks after you've done the following. First, you have to build one of the other available classes. So you start out with access to water and power production on municipal. As soon as you've built one of those to level one and you control at least two settlements, you will unlock Caravan Services. And Caravan Services, once it's built to at least level one and has a settler assigned, will automatically connect to any other Caravan Services plots in other settlements that are nearby and also have those built up plots and have settlers at them. So if you go to your map and you measure approximately the distance from Sanctuary to Lexington, that's a good idea for the range that they will connect. The goal is to try and get you to build an empire that has a natural progression to it where settlements are connecting from one to another in a little chain. So for example, if we built a caravan services in Starlight, it would connect to Sanctuary. We could then build another in Taffington Boathouse and then that would connect to Starlight. And since there is a chain between them, they would all share resources, just like in the base game with the provisioner system. Only in this, you don't choose which settlements, you just build caravan services in proximity 
of one another. So for most players, they find that Caravan Services becomes one of the must-have plot classes you want inside of every one of your settlements, and most city plans are designed with that in mind. So when you get to city plans, you'll find that most of them will have a municipal plot with Caravan Services already pre-chosen for you because it's that important to the gameplay loop. So once you've got that shared, you will see on the resource panel at the top, instead of saying resources, it now says caravan network, showing you that this is the total number of resources available across all of your settlements in the caravan network. All right, hopefully this video cleared up some of the mysteries around virtual resources and got you started. Keep an eye out for additional videos on virtual resources. We'll go into some of the more advanced things you can do with them and another video regarding supplies, which are the new resource class that was introduced with the chapter three mechanics. All right, guys, take care and enjoy the mods.